Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Honeycutt, Communications Specialist for BBB, and I want to welcome you to the Telework Basics webinar. Some quick housekeeping notes before we begin. We have sent a list of all the webinar recordings out to our accredited businesses and have been updating bbbevents.org. You should receive an email today with a list of upcoming webinars, but for additional information and to register, please visit bbbevents.org. Given the recent shelter-in-place orders for the state of North Carolina, today's webinar will provide resources and insight to help you successfully navigate working from home. I'm pleased to introduce our panel of professionals, including Blake Phillips and Ben Harrell from the, the Vericom Group and Melanie Deal from Melanie & Co. Marketing Collective. Let's dive into the first section, Managing Employees Remotely. Blake, I'll pass it off to you to provide a brief overview and an introduction into managing employees remotely. Hey, everybody. Uh, glad to be here today. I hope everybody is safe and sound and doing well and practicing social distancing, getting used to working at home remotely. Hopefully, we'll be able to share some things that will make your life a little bit easier or at least help you to navigate it further from here. From my standpoint, I think the topic that I'm looking at covering Really, I want to start off with the fact that if you haven't done this before, if you've not really gotten into video conferencing, if you're not working remotely with your current team, then take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. You'll figure it out. It'll all work out. Um, there's a lot of things that are going to happen. If you haven't done it before, you're going to dial into a video conference the first time and something's going to go wrong. You're going to have an issue. It's not going to be perfect. That's okay. We'll laugh at it and figure it out and move on. If you're the leader of your company, of your team, then people are looking for you to give them that confidence and to help them to navigate it. So it's gonna be okay that uh, they're gonna make some mistakes. I uh, think that one of the things that you wanna also keep in mind is flexibility with regards to how you're getting things set up and working with your employees. There is a trust factor when it comes to working at home. If you haven't done it before, then you have to remember that you hired the people that you have working with you for a reason because they're talented and they do a good job and they should be able to continue to do that same good job at home. So from a technology standpoint, there are a lot of different ways that you can communicate with people when you're uh, working remotely. Um, I think that there are so many that what I'd like to do rather than going into some detail for all of them, we'll uh, leave that open for questions. I mean, you're talking Skype and freeconferencecall.com, Zoom, Google Hangouts, Slack. I mean, the list goes on and on. There are tons of them out there. Uh, all of them work pretty well, at least the ones that I've used. Uh, we haven't used all of them. We don't do a lot of video conference. We do some video conference. So one of the things that I'm willing to acknowledge to you all is that there are things that I don't know as much about and I am learning just like you are. Um, as, a, as an example, oh, I'll go the wrong way. Does anybody notice anything in this, this picture right now here that might, might not be good? Well, I, I do, I've got some liquor bottles behind me over here. Um, I think we all forget, you know, when we're in the environment that we're in, you know, we've looked here, my background looks pretty good. Test these things out in advance. Make sure that you are, you're checking in advance to see that your background looks good. The, we did a team call here before this as well to make sure that the video worked, that the lighting was good. But like I said before, even if that didn't work, we'll, we'll make our way through it and we'll figure it out. So awesome. I'm going to so stop <laughs> talking. <Yeah. laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, and just another quick housekeeping note, guys, we're going to go through a couple different topics. So if you have a question at any point, please be sure to put it in the question box and I'll be sure to um, pass that on to our panelists. But we do have a few questions um, that we already have. So I'll go ahead and ask you, Blake, the first one we have is, what's the best way to check in with team members? Should we do a video, a phone call, email? What do you recommend? Uh, from my standpoint, I, the first thing I would say is, how do you check in currently? And if the answer is, well, we're at the office together, we're, we're working together, um, clearly you have a different standard than what you did before when people are working remotely. 
The next thing I would offer from there is to get your input from your employees and your staff. Uh, ask them what they think is going to work best. Ask them how they would like to be communicated to and communicated with. Not everybody likes video conference. There are definitely advantages to video conference. As we're looking at each other now, uh, one of the things I want to point out is that you know, I'm, I'm wearing a T-shirt. The reason I'm wearing the T-shirt is because this is how I normally come to work. Our office is set up that we don't have clients coming in, so we have more of a comfortable environment. If you are normally this way, then that's the way you should be on your your call. Um, I would definitely keep you know keep that in mind as the as you look at at the way that you're setting these things up. Awesome, great, thanks so much. Um, and then kind of going into the next question, you touched on it slightly, but how often should I check in with my team? Uh, very similar to what you're doing right now. Uh, if you have regularly scheduled meetings face to face, then you simply have those either audio call or a video call. If you normally check in with somebody during the day by walking over to their office to chat with them, then you can just pick up the phone and call them. You don't want to inundate people and you don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want to feel like they're being micromanaged, but you definitely want to make sure that they know that you're there and it gives them the opportunity to know that they can tell you that they're working, that here I am at home doing what I need to do. If I like the video call, especially when it's, you're talking about a group, then you can tell everybody's paying attention. You can see what they're doing. If it's just an audio call, then people are doing a lot of different things. Maybe they don't, they aren't dressed up, which is okay. It's up, up to you and your team to determine how you dress at home and how you work remotely. Clearly, if you're going to make in a presentation to a client, you would take that into consideration. But I, I would suggest that as far as the, the frequency goes, that you're going to over communicate more so than under communicate. In other words, you probably need to reach out more to make sure people uh, know that you're there, you're available and that they're there and available and that you can reach them. That one of the things that, that always that frustrates me a little bit about people working at home is if I'm looking at my computer and I'm working on something, I'm like, Oh man, Hey, Hey Ben, I can just toller into his office where I can hop up and go in and get him. I don't get to do that with the, the phone call. Um, so there are some things that you have to navigate. So you need to be willing to pick up the phone more often, not just, not just email and text, you know, especially if it's anything complicated. It's annoying to me to have something to deal with that's complicated via a platform of, of email or text when a phone call can make it so much easier and so much clearer. Uh, I would definitely schedule more calls uh, during that time, but you don't want anybody to think that you're not trusting them with, with regards to what they're doing. Awesome. Great advice. Thanks. Um, the next question is, how can we remain on the same page and or track projects to get project progress? So you kind of mentioned being able to just call over to your coworker in their office, but um, how can you stay on track? working from home and and be sure that those projects you know you're meeting deadlines and things well that, that's i'm going to say the same thing i said before how are you doing it currently if the answer is i'm walking over their desk to check on their project and see what they're doing then obviously you need to change that there are some collaborative tools that that can be used the problem with the collaborative tools if you've not used them before is taking the time to navigate and figure out how to use them now. Certainly worth investing in because some of them work really well. Uh, Google Docs is a good example for looking at documents and sharing. Uh, Slack, Microsoft Teams, you know, once again, the list goes on and on of ways that you can actually see each other's work and communicate direct time, share documents, and look at them together. Those are all excellent ways to, to track setting proper expectations with your team about what you expect from them, how often that you expect to hear from them, updates on their progress and the format that that update should be in is very important. You need to be clear and concise 
and you need to hold clear to that standard yourself as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, and that kind of segues into another question that we just got from an attendee is, um, should there be a level of understanding that pe people will be less productive at home? Uh, not necessarily, no. Uh, I'll, I'll be candid and speak my mind. I know Ben's going to laugh at me in the corner here. At a higher level, my personal opinion is that I think people are more uh, apt to work harder and be more productive when they're at the office. But that is a general statement. It's not everybody. And under the circumstance, you may not have any, well, you don't have any choice. I mean, I'm here at my office today, by the way. I'm the only one here. Everybody else is working remotely. So I'm social distancing and being safe. And uh, all of my team is, is working remotely. We have a video conference scheduled tomorrow, which is our regular time for our weekly meeting. And then I'm talking to everybody every day. Uh, they, these are, these are, it's important to continue to, you know, keep in touch with people the same way that you would before. Uh, and if you can't, then using the tools that you have will make a big difference. Uh, so working at home, this is a temporary thing for a lot of people. Well, hopefully <laughs> in two, three weeks, we'll all be back at the office working, doing our thing the way we normally would. Those who are working remotely will continue to work remotely in the same fashion. We will have learned something from this. We'll be better prepared and we will know how the technology works. We'll make improvements to be able to communicate with people at, uh, at home and that trust level will start to, to rise. But I think that as long as you set the expectations for people and it's task oriented and driven and goals, then you can track what they're doing remotely the same as you can here. The biggest loss to me is just that that team interaction in a face-to-face -face basis that's hard to replace. The off-the-cuff things that happen that you get a chance to chat with somebody about the more detailed calls or more detailed conversations that you would have over and above a call. But if you set the right expectations with your team, then you can have that trust and you can have faith that they will get the job done. Awesome. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, transitioning, making the transition easy by using software and things that you're already using or you were using in the office now when you're working remote. Um, but a question we got is, some members of my team have a lower level of understanding of Google Docs, et cetera. Is there any training available for that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's tons out there. And I know that the way this is working right now, um, this is sort of my section. But Ben and Melanie, I, you, you know that you can always jump in on this, as I may jump in on your section as well. Uh, there's look at YouTube is, is fantastic for finding ways to set things up. I will tell you in advance to be patient and allow yourself extra time to do some research on these things and allow your employees the extra time. You use something for the first time, it doesn't always work the way that you thought it was going to work, and it doesn't get set up the way that you thought it was going to get set up. So if you have a two o'clock call and it's a video call and you haven't done this before, then your, your employees and you need to be on that call at least five minutes, if not 10 minutes early to make sure that you are dealing with the technology in a, in a positive way. But there, there are tons of, matter of fact, there's maybe too much information out there isolating where the best places to go are can be difficult. The apps that I'm seeing right now have very good tutorials on themselves. So if you wanted to look at, uh, you know, a, a Google Hangouts, like, just simply go on and find Google Hangouts and they will walk you through exactly what you need to do. Yeah, I would agree with that, Blake. Um, and, and as far as the tools, you, you mentioned two or three. Uh, and I, in, in my session on operations, I was going to actually address some of those and some others as well. Uh, one thing you haven't mentioned is uh, being able to remote into your computer at work. Uh, I do that a lot myself. Uh, and I use a, uh, a very simple way of doing that. It's called Chrome Remote Desktop. 
we use Chrome as our browser at the office and uh, it's just, you can go to the Chrome store on whatever device you're using and, and download that, that app and install it on your browser. And you do that on each computer. And when you install it, you can say you want to set up this computer for remote access or for uh, dialing into another computer or connecting to another computer. And you can do both for the same computer, actually. But the set, each setup is different. Uh, and that way, I'm using all the same tools that I have on my computer at work as I do at home. You have to have a pretty decent internet connection at home, but it doesn't have to be super. Uh, 25 meg or 20 meg would probably be more than good enough, unless somebody's doing a lot of streaming at home. <laughs> uh, and that might be happening today. So. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, we actually got a question about, you know, all of the um, abundance of people trying to go online and use Zoom and Skype and all of those things. Um, and they mentioned uh, they were trying to use Zoom, but the site was a little overwhelmed. What are the other platforms have you had good luck with and would you recommend? Freeconferencecall.com is a, is a good one. It's free. <laughs> And mm -hmm. the video and audio work uh, work well. And that may be one that is less overwhelmed. Zoom got a lot of great publicity from this. I mean, they really did. The negative for them is they got hit hard with being able to support everything that came in. What other options do you guys see, Melanie and Ben? Well, uh, Skype is certainly something that people have used. It's been around a long time. It's not quite as good for video, multi-party video conferencing as Zoom is or free conference call. Uh, but there are several others as well, but those are probably the, the three most well-known ones. I would agree with that. I was actually part of a conversation today where people were talking about something called eight by eight, and I don't know anything about it, but evidently, it's not getting very good reviews right now. So I think the most the most popular and well-known and easy to navigate systems are Zoom, Google Hangouts, and Skype, like y'all have said, and free conference call. Yeah, um, we I actually got a notice this past week. We have several clients that use Ring Central. It's a hosted voice over IP service like 8x8 and phone booths and a bunch of others. Um, they're actually, if you have an account, they are actually offering free video conferencing for up to 100 people at the moment, uh, at least for the duration until they say not, but it's kind of like Zoom right now. Uh, and they, they have a really robust platform. Uh, I haven't heard any feedback about people using that yet, but uh, that's definitely an option if you have a Ring Central account. You would have to have an account in order to, to use that. The, I assume 8 by 8 would be the same way. They're, they're not free services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Probably most voice over IP hosted providers. Uh, Nextiva is another one. Uh, Skytel is a company that's right here in the Research Triangle. Uh, there's a ton of other ones. Uh, probably all of them have video conferencing options with their service. Awesome. Yes, great recommendations. Thank you all so much. Um, and the final question we have for the managing employees remotely says, should I require my team to send a write-up of what they accomplish daily or on a weekly basis? Um, going back to my original statement, <laughs> how are you managing them currently? I mean, it, it, if you are expecting that from them currently, then you should get the same thing. If you're worried that, wow, how do I know that they're getting something done at, at home versus getting done at the office? And they don't normally present something specific to you in written format or in a verbal face-to-face me -face meeting. Then, yeah, I see your point. You, you want to know that they're getting done what they have to get done. That goes back to setting the expectations to begin with and making sure that you have 
communicated with them properly and not just communicated, but even at the risk of over communicating, seeking their opinion. Uh, I like to ask people that work for me, what works for you? This is what I need. I need to know that you're on top of your task and you're getting your job done. What's the best way for us to communicate that back and forth? And I have a great staff. I, I believe in them. And do they are they perfect? Well, of course not. Do they make mistakes? Yes. But helping them be a part of this, the communication is really important. If you know what they need to get done and you know when it needs to get done, it's okay to send the reminder email if you're not sure because you're unused to somebody not being here at the office to check on. I don't think that it, as long as your, your team knows that and they understand that this communication is different, then they should be on board with not feeling like you're spying on them or micromanaging them. You know, you all have the same goal in mind. We need to get the job done. We need to continue business as usual in a different circumstance than what we had before. And we need to make sure that we're communicating properly. So this is the task that we need to get done. Here's how we expect to be presented with that information and the time frame. And then you hold people accountable and they hold themselves accountable. Awesome. Thank you so much, Blake. So um, just as a recap, if you're managing employees remotely, think about what you were doing before all this started and the easiest transition you can make into now working remote. Um, so just slight housekeeping as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the questions box and we'll be sure to get to those. Um, we're going to jump over to our next topic, but if you have any questions about a topic we're not currently on, still feel free to drop those questions in there. We're happy to answer them. Um, so next, we're going to segue into webinars, and we're actually going to have Melanie tell us a little bit about webinars and how we can use them um, and just kind of some best practices. So I'll pass that off to her. Thank you, Catherine. Um, my name is Melanie Deal, and I'm here to talk to you all about webinars today. So um, we're participating in one right now. A lot of people are curious about what are the best platforms to use for webinars and Zoom, which we're using, uh, which I use extensively, and GoToWebinar, which we're using today, are probably the two most popular webinar platforms for people to use. So we have to keep in mind that these are typically not free platforms. There is a small fee associated with them on a typical basis. But let's talk about Zoom for just a minute, which is one of the most popular ones, and we've talked about it a little bit already today. Zoom is, there, there are different levels of, of Zoom or membership that you can purchase with the product. So there is a free level of membership with Zoom. And from what I understand, they've made some exceptions to the, the free level of Zoom right now, considering the current circumstances. I use the paid platform, which is the first, the lowest tier uh, paid platform, and it's $15 a month, and it's very affordable, and it really provides a lot of the resources and the tools that I need in order to hold a, a webinar for as up, to, up to 100 people at a time, and I can go for as long as I need to. For example, um, later in April, I'm going to do an eight-hour webinar, so it'll manage that for eight full hours. That's going to be a long webinar, um, but it enables me to do that, and it's only $15 a month. So that's a real affordable platform, and it's pretty easy for people to use. Um, I'm, I'm going to use Zoom as the meeting space rather than the webinar platform. The webinar platform on Zoom is a little bit more expensive, but the meeting, the meeting platform works very well for this particular purpose. Um, so some of the people have been asking about, you know, if I've never run a webinar before, what do I need to know? What are some of the tools that I need to have? And there's three really important things that we need to keep in mind when we're doing any kind of video at all. And the number one thing is lighting. We need to make sure that we have good lighting. Um, that's going to be key so people can really connect with us. They can see us well, um, whether it's on a webinar or a video that you're recording. So make sure you've got some good lighting around. If you don't have good lighting in your space, maybe you're working from, you know, the den, which my husband's doing this week, um, and he needed to run a webinar, then we would probably add some additional lighting to the room. Ring lights are good, but they're not necessary. You have lots of lamps around your house, I'm sure that you could bring in to add additional lighting to your space. Two other things you need to keep in mind if you're running a webinar or creating video is, do you have a good camera? 
Um, I have a I have an OK webcam on my laptop, but I have an external webcam that I purchased because it's a little bit clearer and crisper. And the same for audio. I bought an external microphone to use. So it's really important that the message gets across to our audience. So even if they can't see us so well with the lighting and the, the video, if they can hear us, they can still can they can still get the message that we're sending. And that's why audio is going to be key for this. So those are the three primary tools that I say every everyone needs to have when they're getting ready to run a webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, so we'll jump into a few questions we have. Um, so you mentioned the must haves and everything. Do you have any advice for how to elevate my webinar and take it to the next level? Okay, uh, there's a few things that you can think about doing. Um, having a script or having a teleprompter, if you will, if you need to run PowerPoint slides or a slide deck on Google Slides or something, sometimes people will use a separate monitor. So maybe they'll have an iPad or a tablet or a Chromebook or something that's off to the side that they use it as a teleprompter, if you will, so they can keep, because when we first get started, sometimes there's this nervous, there's these nerves, right? There's this level of, I've never done this before and I wanna make sure that that I don't forget anything. So having that teleprompter or even having notes, people don't care if you read your notes. So just make sure that you're confident. Um, try a couple of practice runs first. Um, have that have that teleprompter up there. Maybe you want to make sure that the background behind you is clean, like Blake talked about with his his awards and his photos behind him. I've got a screen behind me. Zoom has some really great backgrounds that we can use right now that are free. There are a lot of other third party tools that are creating virtual backgrounds so we can use those on Zoom as well. And that will elevate your webinar and kind of take it to the next level and make it a little bit more uh, professional or, or whatever you want it to be. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the next question we have is, what additional ass assets should I consider when hosting a webinar? Mm, make sure you get good, good, strong Wi-Fi. Um, I think that's going to be a, a, an issue for a lot of us working from home, especially if we've got several people working from home, if we've got kids at home now and they're streaming on their tablets or streaming on Netflix or Pandora or whatever they're doing, that can really take some bandwidth. So making sure you've got some good, strong Wi-Fi signal is going to be one of the key things that you need to make sure that your webinar doesn't go out. Now, we are all in the same boat right now, so we all get it. Technology can glitch and like Blake was talking about earlier people will forgive us for technology it's not our fault technology goes out right so be gracious on yourself your audience will be gracious with you and if, if it gives out just it, tell everybody to come back in and we'll just pick up where we left off awesome awesome um, so the next question says should I keep it simple and host alone or have guest speakers ah that's a great question. That's going to depend on the message that you have. For example, we've got a panel here today with panelists on it, so we're all contributing to it. What, does, what is your message? What do you need to send to your audience? Do you need to bring in experts to talk about different areas of expertise that are all relevant to the content and the message that you want to send out? If you're going to have additional panelists and guest speakers, um, I encourage you to limit it to the number of guest speakers or panelists that you have because it can be overwhelming. One of the things that we need to keep in mind when we're doing this video conferencing and these meetings and these webinars is there can be a lag or a delay in the communication. And I could be talking and Blake might think that I'm done and he might start talking. And so then we're talking over top of each other. So the fewer people you have, the less likely you're going to experience that situation. So it really just depends on what the message is and how who you need to bring in to share their area of expertise as well. Awesome, thanks. And kind of piggybacking off of that, when is it appropriate to have guest speakers? Right. So if you are, um, I had a I had a roundtable that I hosted, um, moderated a couple of weeks ago, and we had people that were talking about all different areas of expertise. We really wanted to talk about how. People need to manage their employees, which we're talking about today, and bookkeeping and making sure that people are understanding all the things that are happening with the tax laws and everything right now. So I brought in experts to talk about those two particular topics because that's not my area of expertise. 
but it is important to my audience because my audience is small business owners. So it made sense to bring in experts to talk about topics that were relevant and important for my audience, but I'm not the expert on. So when you find someone that you find a, a topic that your audience is looking for, then you want to reach out to your, your network and find the expert speakers that can help you. Awesome, thanks. We got a couple more questions. Um, where do you promote a Zoom meeting if you want to get more people to attend? Anything other than LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter? Well, share it everywhere that you are. Share it with your email list. Of course, you're gonna share it on your social media platforms. Um, one thing to think about, is there are, I, I can't remember what they're calling them, Zoom bombers or something along those lines right now, where if you're sharing a, a public URL for Zoom, anyone can, can actually access your Zoom meeting and you wanna be very careful with that. So I would caution you if you are using uh, a public platform to share your Zoom URL, that maybe you require a password to get in. So not just anyone can get that get into get into the zoom meeting itself but i would share everywhere that you are online you can create events on eventbrite that's free for you to do if your event is free and doesn't cost you anything um, you can create events on the different well you can create an event on facebook and you can create an event on google my business um, Google My Business is kind of funny right now with the COVID-19 response, but I think you can still create events there. You can create events on LinkedIn. So if there's several different places that you can create that event online and have them all direct back to that one Zoom link or webinar link. Awesome. Um, going off of that, it says, how often should you use the webinar platform or should you vary what platform you use, such as Facebook Live, Instagram Live, or just plain video on social accounts? So I think it's really crucial that we consider where our audience is. So if most of our audience is on Instagram, you probably want to create some Instagram Live or Instagram video. Uh, YouTube video is a great platform for us to create content because it's just a really phenomenal search engine. Find out where your audience is spending time. I don't know that I would vary it up a whole lot because you want to kind of create that sense of consistency throughout this time frame. So I would experiment a little bit in the beginning, find out where you get the greatest response, and then continue on that platform. And then your audience will become accustomed to seeing you there. Awesome, thank you. The next question is, how long should a webinar be in order to get the best results? <laughs> Million dollar question. <laughs> Um, as long as it takes for you to get the information across and for everyone to get their questions answered. So that, that is really the million dollar question. It should probably be, typically speaking, no longer than an hour, hour and a half, depending on the round table that I moderated a couple of weeks ago was an hour and 15. And we ended up going an hour and a half because people had so many questions. So we wanted to build in a little bit of flexibility when we're doing this, especially when it's something live and um, we don't really know what kind of response we're gonna get from our audience. So I encourage you to think about that. Um, the eight hour one that I'm doing is a paid class. It's a high level class. So that's going to be eight hours. That's gonna be a really long time for people we're going to take breaks throughout. If you are going to do an extended time frame, make sure that you build in breaks because people will get computer fatigue, um, the instructor and and the audience as well. So keep that in mind if you go with extra long on your on your sessions. Awesome. Um, a question we had is: Does Zoom record their meetings? You can record your meetings on Zoom, and that's one of the re really um, great benefits that I like about Zoom is the ability to record meetings. Then I can turn those into videos and upload them to my YouTube channel or add them to my private courses that I have for my clients. Um, sometimes it's really great if you're just doing a meeting and it's not necessarily a webinar, but it's a private meeting like with your team or with a client, that's really great to record that meeting as well because then you can go back and you can review it again. So in case the meeting went long or it went a little sideways where you weren't expecting it to go, you can go back and access that information at a later date and review all your notes. So it's a great resource to record. You can record directly to your computer or you can record on the cloud. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, do you typically answer questions at the end or as they come in? That's gonna present, uh, be based on the presenter style, to be honest with you. 
I am a very dialogue, interactive, engaging instructor. So when I present webinars, I like to know that my audience is getting their questions answered in a timely fashion. If I'm doing something that's going to be an hour and a half, I want to be able to answer those questions throughout. But that's the way that I prefer to teach and to present information. So I think it's going to really be based on how the presenters, um, what, what their personal preference is. Awesome. Um, and the last question we have right now is, do you find people pay attention more when everyone's video is on? Yes. Yes, people pay attention more when everyone's video is on. And for the presenter, it's to, to me anyway, it's much easier to present when I see other people's faces. So because I'm so used to presenting in person. So if that's your style, if you're used to presenting in person, now suddenly you're doing it online and virtually, having that feedback and the expressions from other people is really going to be very, very helpful for you. And it's gonna kind of ease that tension and that fear when you're just getting started. So I encourage everyone to keep your video on, Make let the instructor or the presenter um, be comfortable and know that you're there and that you're interacting, engaging. And we know that people are multitasking when we're on webinars, that's okay. Um, I think it really helps the, it helps the overall uh, concept and the overall success of, of the webinar be much more successful. Awesome, and we got one more. Um, how do you help less tech savvy coworkers navigate the navigate these platforms when you yourself are remote? Ask that again. <laughs> uh, how do you help your less tech savvy coworkers navigate these platforms when you yourself are remote? So, like helping them learn to use Zoom or go to webinar or whatever it is when you know you're remote yourself. Right. So. Um, I would, I would make sure that they have, there's tutorials everywhere for all of these platforms. So it's super easy. I would just make sure that you send them the link on how to install Zoom, make sure that they're getting the right app on their device. So they, because there are a couple of different ones and it might be a little bit confusing when they're just getting started. So the one who knows how it works, I would make sure that you send that information out to everybody else that's going to be attending, whether it's coworkers or someone who's just gonna be watching it in, in advance or out, outside of your organization, make sure that you send that information in advance and it's super easy they're really easy tools to navigate so if you just send them a quick tutorial just grab that link off of the different platforms and send that to them awesome, or thanks. or yep. <laughs> they can ask their tech savvy spouse or house partner or teenagers who are now home from yeah. school to 12, 12 year old child <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> awesome um another few questions um it says suggestions for attire on video conferencing okay good question um solid colors are best whatever your brand is but most importantly whatever you feel comfortable wearing so if you feel comfortable in what you're wearing that confidence is going to come across instantly so make sure that you're comfortable and um, probably solid colors work better than something that's super patterned now Ben's shirt is fine I wore a blue and white shirt a couple weeks ago on a, a webinar that I did and suddenly it looked sparkly on camera so I should have done a camera check before I wore that blouse I wear it in person all the time it's fine so make sure that you're checking your attire before you go awesome um, and the next question says, what is proper etiquette when it comes to video? You mentioned multitasking, but how much multitasking is too much? Well, if you're paying attention, then I think that that's, that's good enough. Taking notes is, is fine, I think. Um, if you have got a, you know 20 different windows open, you're probably not paying very close attention. So there are tools on some of the webinar uh, platforms that you can use that will actually show the attention span of your audience. Um, it doesn't show you who's doing what, it's not that invasive, but it kind of shows the temperature of the audience or the temperature of the room, if that's important to you to know. Um, um, but, you know, you came to this webinar for a reason. So, um, you know, try to limit your multitasking of course. We're home now, so we're distracted by the laundry and the cat and, you know, the phone, but try to pay attention and, and you know, get the, make the most of the time that you have committed to mm -hmm. attending this webinar. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Melanie. We're going to segue into our next topic. Um, but like we've said, if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the questions box and we'll get to them, even if it has to do with one of the topics we already covered of webinars or managing employees remotely. Please feel free to drop those in. Um, the next topic we're going to switch over to is operations. Um, so like how you operate working remotely. And so we're going to have Ben share a little bit about that and what that looks like before we dive into the questions. All right. Thank you. Um, really, most of what I'm going to talk about is online tools for uh, handling operations. Um, a lot of people, I say a lot of people, a lot of companies nowadays have online tools that they use uh, for their operations. We're almost totally online. Uh, we actually have a database application that we use as an online database that manages pretty much all of our operations. And everybody can access on whatever device they have. Or, or at the office. And it includes backup and, and all that, and security and all that. Uh, companies that are service type companies, uh, a lot of those use Zendesk, and there's a lot of other uh, types of ticketing system tools or trouble tools for keeping track of their interactions with customers. And those are almost all online as well nowadays. Um, the three main team software are, are Microsoft Teams, which is part of Microsoft Office 365, and um, Google Docs, of course. And if, if you're a business, you can also subscribe to what Google calls G Suite, which is a administrator managed Google Docs set up for your business. Um, and there's a lot of online information about both of those. If you uh, have Office 365 and you use that in your office, you might already be using Teams. But if you are not, um, you can just do a, a search for um, Google Teams training videos or Google Teams training, and you'll find a bunch of links. You can also do searches on YouTube as well, and you'll find a lot. Um, the same with Google Docs uh, and G Suite. And the third one that is pretty well known is uh, something that Blake mentioned earlier, uh, a software we call Slack. I'm not as familiar with that. I, I tried to do a little bit of research on it, but didn't have a whole lot of time. But from everything I've read, it's it's similar to Teams and similar to G Suite and Google Docs in the types of applications that it supports, an online team uh, building and team communication. Uh, I also mentioned earlier uh, the fact that you can, there, there are quite a few tools available. Chrome uh, Remote Access is a remote desktop is just one of those. Uh, there's an actual remote access feature built into Windows itself. And there are many, many other applications that are free that you can use. There's uh, one that is not free if you use it for business but uh, it's called TeamView, and a lot of companies use that for remote access and remote interaction with remote computers and customers. Quite a few uh, IT service companies use that for remote access. The remote, the uh, IT service company that we use actually uses that for remote access. Um, those are kind of the highlights uh, and I'd be glad to take any questions that anybody might have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so a few questions that we have. 
are um, one of them is what apps or software can make it easier for working remotely? So you listed a few um, different suites and things. Maybe what are your recommendations? Well, I know uh, Microsoft Teams and Slack as well has remote chatting, uh, uh, instant messaging basically, that you can do in, in Microsoft Teams. And I think Slack will also support video connections as well as online chatting. Uh, that's a great way to stay connected and to talk to your teammates uh, easily and quickly. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you'd probably want to look at the video, training videos on how to use that or instructions. Um, but those are the two that I would recommend. I don't think Google Docs is quite as well for that, but I think Hangouts is part of that. So and Hangouts allows you to do chatting and, and online videos as well. Now I think about it. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, the next question we have is, what are some ways we can ensure cybersecurity when most employees are remote? <clears throat> yes, uh, any like uh, Chrome remote access uh, or, or any of the other ones require a, a link to your computer that you would send to somebody and also a password in order to connect which is pretty good security. Um, almost all online applications, like the database we use, for instance, in Microsoft Office 365, uh, those all, all have a username that you have to enter and a password that you have to enter. So they have pretty good security. I think Google Docs, Slack, and, my, and Microsoft Teams uh, also allow you to do two-level um, authentication where you would enter a phone number or, in some cases, an email address, and it would send a security code that you would then have to enter as a second authentication step. Uh, and in these day and times, I would recommend that if you can do it to use that second level of authentication. Just as an aside, I use that for all my connections to Amazon. Mm. They awesome. have that, that uh, two level authentication feature. Awesome, great, great advice. Um, any tips for productivity? Uh, Nothing right off the top of my head other than I think you asked a question earlier about um, doing status reports or something like that, daily status reports or every other day. I think that's a, a good way to, to keep people focused. Uh, if, if the type of work that they're doing lends itself to that, uh, there's certainly a lot of types of work that don't. Uh, but somebody in sales, for instance, would probably need to check in a lot with their sales manager and let them know what's going on. Uh, Blake, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I think that knowing what the, you know, each person's responsibility is, is uh, mm -hmm. so how you fall with those people is different in different ways. You know, we, we have one of the components of our company, we obtain, review, and pay the bills for our clients. So all of their telecommunications, utilities, uh, cable TV, and the team that does that, uh, well, I know they're doing it because <laughs> otherwise we'd get disconnect notices and we would have a big problem. So their task is relatively inherent that they're getting it done on time. So when they send in their regular report, about what they've built, we're able to see that. So from a tracking standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Project management, whole different story. If you've got, um, if you're used to being in an office where you're working with multiple people and direct collaboration, you you need to schedule more calls during this time. You need to have that. Uh, and as we were talking about before, I really do like the face-to-face -face much better. You can see that what people are doing so if I was going to mention Melanie for something and 
I, I don't, it's so a video, I mean, audio call, I don't see her. I, she might have just taken a bite of food and, or she might have just muted inadvertently while she was telling somebody in the room to be quiet or whatever. But if, when you're on video, you can see the expression, you can see that she's ready and prepared to answer this question. So I, I definitely like that. But that type of collaboration and holding people accountable is, uh, is definitely, that, that's a better way to go uh, when you're talking about your video conference. And um, Awesome. Thanks so much. We have roughly 10 minutes left. So just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the questions box so we can get to those. Um, but I'll keep going. Our, our next question is, what are suggestions of how to hire, train, and manage remotely with hopes of going into the office soon? So I'll let anybody take a stab at that. You're actually trying to do that right now, Blake, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's true. Uh, we are looking for some help. I was looking before, and now it's brought up even more into focus. So good for us. We're in a position that we're able to seek, uh, you know, seek somebody to join us. I don't know if we'll get that person identified and hired uh, during the time frame that this goes on, but if we if we did, then that would be awesome. I would be thrilled with that. It's a sales help that we're looking for. And that means that we could do a lot of face-to-face, -face, just like we're doing right now, conversations that would replace that day-to-day, -day, uh, sharing information in different formats that have already been mentioned that we can give them access to see here are the documents that you need to see. And we can talk on the phone like we're doing now to determine you know, how to uh, address those with potential customers. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, I, I guess the, the biggest difference is that you're just not calling people in for the traditional interview. And it gives you a chance to find out how somebody is in an environment like this, which is different than the face-to-face. -face. So some of that can actually be good, especially from a sales standpoint. You want to hear how somebody sounds over the phone. You want to see how they look face to face, but if you can't see them face to face. This is as good as you're going to get for the time being. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like all of our questions have been answered. So, um, before we wrap up, just want to give you guys a minute. If you have anything else to add, Melanie, Blake, or Ben. Nope. I, did, I did want to mention one thing uh, that I forgot to mention, and that was with Teams. Uh, I do know, I'm not sure about Slack, you do have the capability to record uh, audio meetings and video meetings with that. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you all so much for attending this webinar and a big thank you to our panelists, Blake, Ben, and Melanie. As a reminder, please visit bbbevents.org to register for all of our upcoming webinars and be on the lookout for the webinar recordings. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. I hope you all have a great week. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at choneycutt at raleigh.bbb.org. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Bye, everybody. Bye.